Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupont. And today we will be discussing congestive heart failure or CHF. Wow. Now, one of the things I want to start by pointing out, and I think we've discussed this a few times, is people may think when they're going into practice or they're going to less developed parts of the world that they'll be seeing all kinds of communicable diseases, all kinds of infections, but the majority in of deaths in the world are due to non-communicable diseases. And cardiovascular continues to be the leading cause of death in the world. Wow. Cancer's kind of nipping at its heels. Another non-communicable disease, perhaps in some contexts. Right. Um, one of the things that does change when you leave the US is that when you leave Europe, the United States, certain temperate parts of the world and go into certain tropical parts of the world, particularly Central and South America, ischemic heart disease, so lack of blood supply, lack of oxygenation causing heart disease becomes less frequent and a parasitic cause becomes dominant. Uh -huh. Dixon? Should I, I guess which parasite? Please guess. I'm sure you're going to get it's it right. called Chagas disease. Chagas disease caused by? Uh, Trypanosoma cruzi. And that's something, that's a little bit of a paradigm change for some people. That's true. Is that they think about cardiovascular disease, they think about hypertension, right. smoking, yep. cholesterol, sure. risk modification. Well, the sure. risk modification here may be not eating that fruit juice. <laughs> or living in a rural area with a thatched roof home. Exactly. And uh, let's just talk a little bit. We'll take a little aside, a little break, and talk about Chagas disease oh, briefly <laughs> before we get into our okay. congestive heart failure. Well, it's a protozoan uh, infection. It's transmitted by not the bite, but rather the defecation event of a very large bug. It's about that big. It's called the tritomid bug. Another name is the kissing bug or the reduvidae bug. It's present throughout South and Central America, and there's even some species that live in the southern part of the United States. They can all transmit this infection from themselves to a mammalian host that they feed on. But in order to become infected, it's not the bite of the organism, of the tritomid bug, that introduces the organism into it, like it would be, let's say, for malaria and a mosquito, but rather, in order to make room for the blood meal that it's about to take, it has to clear out the gut tract of the prior blood meal it took maybe a week ago. And in that prior blood meal is the developmental stages for this parasitic infection. And the last little bit of intestine for this bug contains the infectious stage for the mammalian host. So as the blood is absorbed by the reduvid bug, it volumetrically pushes out the digested processed blood from its last blood meal and deposits it on the skin somewhere wherever the bite is taking place. For humans, a lot of these bugs are nocturnal in their habits, so they bite at night. You might be sleeping. You might be sleeping under a blanket because in some parts of rural South America, you live in very high altitudes like Peru, Ecuador, Chile. They have mountains and you sleep in not air conditioned or heated houses. So you use a lot of blankets. So you're all, all your body is covered except for your face. And the bug will come down out of this thatched roofed home and seek out a place on your body and that's usually on your face. That's why it's called a kissing bug. And it kisses you, <laughs> not quite but it injects an anesthetic first so that this large proboscis that it needs to get your blood doesn't cause any pain. Very sinister animal, this reduvid bug. And at the same time, of course, defecates. Then it flies back into its little nest up there and grows a little bit more. And in the meantime, it injects material that causes itching. And this little kid, usually a little kid, it could be an adult, starts to rub their eye because it starts to itch in their sleep, and they rub this feces containing the infectious stage of trypanosoma cruzi into their mucous membrane of their eye. The organism has the capacity for infecting the tissue surrounding the eye. And what it does is it causes the tissue to swell up. It has a name. It's called a shagoma. It's painless. 
And you can tell right away where it is. It's a sign. It's not a symptom. It's a sign. It says, oh, you've got one eye bigger than the other. Mm -hmm. If you go to the pre-Columbian figurines that were carved or made out of clay by the Mayans and the Incas in the Anthropological Museum in Mexico City, you can find one of those with one eye that's bigger than the other as a representation of Chagas disease that dates back to the time before Columbus landed in the New World. At any rate, it's been around a while. The sequelae is even more sinister because while there's no pain associated with this and nobody says, well, he's got Chagas disease, what are we gonna do? Well, just let it run its course. It's not gonna kill you. Well, it's not gonna kill you as a kid, but this organism from this point on is an intracellular parasite for the most part. And it spreads slowly throughout the body. And it has a penchant for cardiac tissue and nervous tissue. The myenteric plexus, the nervous system that stimulates the gut tract to contract, that's affected. And 30 years later, 30 years, 40 years later sometimes, as this disease progresses and your heart begins to enlarge and you begin to to get into cardiac insufficiency because it can't pump the blood as well as it should, you begin to suffer from symptoms. And there are several varieties of this. But the point is that it's a late onset disease. And in fact, if you look back in the history of cardiac transplants, the fourth person to ever receive a heart was a Chagas disease victim. Yeah. So this is, I think, important when we're looking at heart failure, we leave the developed world, we still have a large number of patients with ischemic heart disease, but now we also have infective um, issues, so Chagas disease, yeah. and we also, in other parts of the world, rheumatic heart disease can be a major That's cause of valvular huge. conditions leading to um, congestive right. heart failure. So. It changes a little when you when you leave the developed world, and so I think that's important to think about what's in your local area. So your your clinical disease is going to be somewhat similar. I will say right. we talk about forward and backward flow symptoms. So one of the things that a patient might present with to sort of back up high pressure issues is they may have swelling of their legs, so called pitting edema. Yeah. You know, when you push on the legs, you actually can leave a thumbprint because the swelling gets to be so bad. Um, a lot of patients will tolerate this, will not, will not notice it, will not complain about it, so to speak. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. Um, it doesn't interfere with their ability to perform the activities of exactly. daily living. It doesn't exactly. interfere with their ability to do what they need to do to support themselves and their family. That's correct. But then you start having issues with trouble breathing. They're trying to work, they're trying to walk up a hill. Yeah. They're having trouble breathing. They're trying to do the activities they're doing. Now they're not doing a good job of being able to do that because the heart failure is leading to symptoms that interfere with daily living. So shortness of breath, swelling of the legs, these are things that might bring them to medical attention. Um, how do we know that this isn't caused by many of the other things that might cause? Um, you know, and one of the things in an ideal situation is ultrasound. And ultrasound is actually becoming more available in many parts of the, of the world. It's actually now a portable device, not much larger than which fit in my hands, not much larger than maybe one of these smartphones, um, where you can actually do an ultrasound wow. and look at heart function. So inexpensive technology is allowing us to, to make these diagnoses in, in a slightly better way. But again, you're gonna need someone who's a competent technician, yep. a competent clinician who can read and interpret these images. So diagnosis by ultrasound is ideal, uh, but this diagnosis can be made clinically based on symptoms and physical signs. You also have to know where the patient's from. To be thinking about what <laughs> exactly. might cause, yeah. If they're from Africa and they've never left Africa, they can't be suffering from Chagas disease because mm -hmm. it's only found in Central and South America. So that's one way of distinguishing the causative effects of exposure. Yeah, the different etiologies exactly. of, of the heart. Exactly failure. right. Um, other things that you might look for on exam is um, the jugular venous pressure. Ah. So you can actually have the patient turn their neck. You can look at the jugular venous pulsations 
and you can actually gauge, you can estimate the filling pressures. Whoa. You can do a technique called a hepato jugular reflux. You're still looking here, but now you're applying um, pressure to the liver, about 20 millimeters of mercury pressure. And if the pressure stays up, that actually is an estimation of wedge or left-sided pressure. People always think like, really? oh, it's the right side of the heart because you're pushing more <laughs> blood. Yeah. Um, but back in the 70s, they actually did a study where they used um, catheters inside the heart. So it's oh, another, yeah. another maneuver you can do at the bedside. Sometimes ah. people use a blood pressure cuff so they know they're getting the right amount of pressure they're putting on the liver. Um, another thing, you might hear crackles. You might hear discontinuous sounds oh, in the bases of the lungs from fluid that's building up from the, the high pressures. Um, you may, as we mentioned, the pitting edema, the fluid that we're seeing down the legs. And you may, when you listen to the heart, you may hear an S3 gallop. Or with Chagas disease, you may hear fixed splitting of one of the heart sounds. Right. So making the diagnosis, as we mentioned, can be done clinically. Ideally, you've got ultrasound to do it. But once you've made the diagnosis, let's talk about treatment. Mm. And I'm gonna say, it's not always drugs. Nope. Sometimes the drugs are worse than the disease. And so um, one of the things you can do, and we've talked a little bit about this, is dietary improvements and salt restriction. Right. And those sort of go hand in hand. Now, certain um, populations in the world um, ha are very salt sensitive and they're gonna do a little bit better when you're adjusting the salt intake. Um, weight, if you have a patient who's heavy and you can accomplish weight loss, which I think we'll be honest is always a challenge, particularly when their ability to do activity is limited by a cardiac condition. Uh, um, you probably want consistent fluid intake. You want them roughly consuming about the same amount of fluid per day, usually a little more fluids than they're used to but not overdoing it because you can have issues with sodium level fluctuations. Um, the next thing we recommend is avoiding alcohol. Oh. I know, <laughs> I knew I would get that reaction. Not only can alcohol um, make heart failure, but there actually are a, a fair number of cardiomyopathies, heart failure that are due to excessive alcohol consumption. Yeah. Smoking in many parts of the world. Smoking is actually in, on the rise, increasing. Um, so smoking is something we recommend being avoided. Um, part of this is because of ischemic heart disease, but I'm just gonna say in general, we're gonna recommend against smoking. Exercise. Um, exercise can really improve outcomes in patients that have heart failure. Hmm. So cardiac rehabilitation, exercise, you're gonna have them slowly ease into this and of course be limited if it's gonna trigger chest pain. Of course. Because you don't wanna have them overdo it and then trigger uh, more damage. Right. Um, and then helping them with either vaccination strategies for pneumonia, pneumococcus, uh, for influenza, um, or if this is someone who's had um, a prior rheumatic heart disease, we may be looking at chronic penicillin, ways of preventing infections which may make an already bad condition worse. Or a valve replacement. You know, that's interesting. We, we often think, well, oh, that's such a high resource um, endeavor. But in a lot of parts of the world, there are uh, non-governmental organizations that are going out. And if patients are properly routed, they're actually, they might have access to a, a valve replacements. See that? Yeah. Yep. So things to think about. Don't, I always, I always say, just because your clinic doesn't provide it, doesn't mean your clinic shouldn't find out who does provide sure, it absolutely. and try to see if your patient might have access. So before mechanical, pharmacological, so we'll talk about medications. Um, a big change in the prognosis of heart failure was the introduction of beta blockers. It used to be with medicines we would slow the decline. Beta blockers, we can actually improve heart function. So beta blockers are a class of drugs. ACE inhibitors, angiotensin, um, converting enzyme inhibitors, another class of drugs. Diuretics are not gonna improve mortality, but they can do a great job of symptomatic management. Sure, sure. Um, which for a lot of individuals is a big thing. And then mechanical interventions, as you mentioned, if this is due to a tight valve or dysfunctional valve, sure. getting them connected with um, a surgical group that might be able to address that. Um, sometimes it can be related to electrical activity. So again, you've got to look at what are your resources and what can you make available for your patients. Right. Last resort, 
heart transplant. That is true. And as mentioned, even in areas of the world where Chagas is a leading cause, heart transplant may, may come. Exactly. The only difficulty that I have with that strategy is that here's a heart that comes from someone who died of an automobile accident or mm -hmm. some other traumatic event, probably. And it's Chagas free. But the body of the person that's getting the heart is not. Mm -hmm. And the drugs that are used to treat Chagas disease are not 100% effective in getting rid of the organism. So eventually, unfortunately, the new heart will become compromised by the infection as well as the rest of the body of that patient. So that's a difficult tightrope to walk, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. All right. Well, if people want to learn more about Chagas, we encourage you to listen to some of our other lectures um, at Parasites Without Borders. You can listen all about Chagas, which I would say if you're going to go to an area of the world with a Chagas, you should know about that because I that is going to be important to know in your treatment, management, diagnosis of heart failure. You bet. Um, but thank you for spending time with us and discussing heart failure. And yep. we look forward to seeing you again. See you next time.